one in 20 Americans live in trailer parks. It is and it isn't stigmatized because it's not a fashionable industry. Do you think you can make it fashionable? I don't know whether I want to make it fashionable. That's an interesting answer. I either do things which are so boring or so complicated that no one takes the time to do that. And if you become really good at one of those two things, you'll have a great career. You mentioned obviously wife and kids. Have there been any things that have stood out when it comes to juggling a marriage and also children with starting a business? I haven't always got it right. It's something I really struggle with because obviously I love my business is really lonely. Where do you see a gap? I of course never predicted the horrors which were COVID, but I did see. Hey guys, before we get into this episode, I just want to say the more subscribers we get, the better the guests are. People come on, the bigger our channel is. So if you want more conversations like this on how people did it, subscribe now. It would really help a lot. Enjoy the episode. You founded Lovett Parks. And for anyone that doesn't know what that is, do you want to give a, a summary? Yeah. So Lovett Parks, we own um, caravan parks. So both holiday, we have a small amount of residential uh, pe people who live on our parks all the year round. And we're in the Southeast, Southwest, started five years ago before that. I built soda farms, wind farms, renewable projects, and before that I was in finance. How did you find like the, the thing that you wanted to specialize in? Because I've suffered from that quite a bit of having just too many things that I want to, that I'm interested in and that I want to focus on. I think a lot of people have that stumbling block. Or the opposite, which is my problem. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not having enough things of like no, It's exactly really hard. I, I think the th key is just start in something, do it for as long as you enjoy it. And then, you know, maybe you'll find something differently. I mean, I've got three kids, and so those kind of questions I'm thinking about, how will I answer <laughs> yeah. them when my kids, yeah. you know, ask me when in a few years' time. Do you think you'll push the entrepreneurial gene onto your, onto your kids? You know what? I was always brought up, being an entrepreneur, you shouldn't be. You should get a stable job. Okay. Don't do it. Yeah. And so, I, you know, who knows? They're all their own persons. I think the most important thing is you don't inflict on them, impose your own kind of whatever. Mm. Focusing more on the on the business, then you, you said you started in finance and then you went to wind farms and solar farms. Yeah, that's okay. So that's a pretty big transition. Before we get to Lover, what made you go from banking? I'm banking. I'm assuming. Yeah, I, I, I was in banking and I, I I basically invested money for wealthy people. That was my skill set. Um, you were at Goldman, right? I was. Yeah, so I was there for ten years and I had a great time. I mean, I, look, I, I learned a lot, met some great people, had some fantastic clients. Um, I was probably there two years too many even though look it's an incredible firm um and one of my former clients basically asked me to help him with his family office he was a su super successful entrepreneur himself mm. and uh having never kind of been involved in the kind of business end of goldman like forming a company hiring people i found that that was really enjoyable and mm. me and a team of three others we basically built a portfolio of solar farms okay uh we didn't have a clue what we were doing um, and we got into it because they'd been looking at it before I joined and then I'd done a deal in Scotland, which is where I'm from, with a local farmer. Everything on a handshake, one of the okay. best things I've ever done. He was a brilliant, he is a brilliant, very lovely, smart person. And we, we did a project together. It was really successful. So I said, look, we should do more of these projects. Mm. We didn't have a clue what we were doing. We were very, very lucky. The guy I was working for was super smart. Um, and it was, I found I really enjoyed it. So we ended up doing about 10 different solar schemes. And the, the biggest was actually one of the biggest in the UK at the time, wow. which was on an old RAF base in Norfolk. Okay. Um, and I just really enjoyed the whole hiring people, a actually creating something, whereas before, you know, I wasn't necessarily, hmm. you know, when I was investing, it was all in kind of public funds or public, you know, shares or you know, different asset classes. Did you have the yearn to, to do that when you were working at Goldman? No, okay. not at all. Um, you know, I, I'm probably one of those people who the circumstances dictated that I ended up in the various careers that I've done as opposed to me having an idea of okay. this is what I want to do and I'm going to do this for five years and then five years. You know what I said earlier, I think everyone should just try things out see if they're any good. Someone once gave me a piece of advice, you either do things which are so boring that no one else wants to do them, or so complicated that no one takes the time to do that. And if you become really good at one of those two things, you'll have a great career. That's pretty good. So, Can you touch on a, a little bit about your time at Goldman? I think that's a world that quite a lot of people are fascinated by and such a small percentage of people actually get access, get access to it. Um, you know what, it's, I, 
I can see you filtering. I feel in like head. he's thinking he's, about what he's yeah. going to say. He's thinking he about what he can and yeah. can't say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. And so um, I kind of look, I it's like all really good firms and there are challenges that they have. But in the long run, I'm very grateful for them for what they gave me, which was a great network, a level of professionalism that, you know, it's hard to kind of replicate it at many other firms. And I, I always think for those entrepreneurs who built successful businesses without having a starting point in a firm like that, wow, I respect them. Mm. Because what it taught me was this ability to be able to juggle lots of different things all at the same time, have much higher standards than what I'd been used to. Um, but also to, you know, for all the criticisms of that firm, there was a great sense of teamwork for the large part. You know, like every firm, there are there are downsides to it, but you know, that's natural. So. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So how long were you at the wind? So well, how long were you at the family family office investing in? For three Wind years. Bob? Three years. Okay. Yeah, and we, so we built about 10 or 15 solar farms. We built some wind farms and we did another hydro scheme and we sold those all to listed uh, kind of yield codes. Right. And, um, you know, I'm always two years late into any trade. I wish I'd done it two years earlier because yeah. if we had done, we would have done our own yield company. And it was about that time that I thought, wow, this is super interesting. And a really old, really old friend of mine, godfather to one of my kids who um, lives in New York as an actor, he came and saw me and said, look, my dad's unwell. He's, he's, do you know anyone who buy any of our caravan parks? And so I said, James, I've known you for 18 years. I've never asked you what that business is like, tell me. So he spent the evening telling me and I thought it was super interesting. Um, so I then called up another friend who's who lives in London and he kind of verified that this was the case. I took my wife and kids on a road trip around California. I'd spent a year at university there. Looked at the situation in America when one in 20 Americans live in trailer parks. One in 20? Yeah, it's actually even more. It's 22 million Americans live in trailer parks. Wow. Out okay. of 330 million. Yeah. Now, the perception of trailer parks is normally negative, mm. but actually... There's, you know, there are 50,000 of them and there's some super high-end ones and there's some amazing retirement communities in the Sunshine States. So, you know, like everything, it's a bit more nuanced than that. And um, I thought, wow, this is really interesting because they all evolved after the Second World War when all the GIs came back and the US government were worried about housing them. Okay. And so their trailer parks can, you know, have sometimes been part of the answer to that housing issue where people will sell their property if they need cash, rent a trailer and then build up that cash space right. and then get back on the property ladder. So I kind of thought, wow, that's super interesting. And at that time, this was 2017, Architectural Digest did a kind of story about a trailer park in on the east coast of the States where the trailer parks went, the trailers actually went for a lot of money. Okay. And I thought that was super interesting. So I kind of got back to England, Google Caravan Park, found an agent down in Devon, a lovely agent said, could I come and spend the day? And I, I came in at it from a residential perspective. To, so what I was saying earlier about the fact that housing is so difficult. And for me, caravans are just a form of prefabricated housing. Yeah. And if you think about, I was inspired by you know Sweden where 80% of homes are prefab, Japan it's something like 25%. Can you explain what prefab is for anyone listening? Yes, yeah, so prefab is they are actually made in factories. Um, and so it's not done in the traditional way, which is on you, you know, housing developments with the bricks. Everything is made in, in factories, designed there, and then brought to site. Kind of like these uh, these small houses, that tiny houses. Elon Musk tiny is houses. living in one of those, yeah, right? It, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. And it's... You know, the prefabs have been around for a very long time. So what was really interesting to me, after the Second World War, similar to the US, the UK government were worried about all these soldiers not having housing. And so they got, um, they commissioned a prize at the Tate Britain and got global architects to design bungalows. And th those bungalows today are still around because the quality was so good. Mm. Wow. Now, if you look at it, Actually, the humble bungalow is one of the most popular forms of accommodation in this country. So it's something like this, according to 2017, it's probably wildly out of date. But if you take all age ranges, it was the number one form of housing choice. 
something like 18% of people would choose the bungalow. If wow. you look at the older, okay. above 50, it's something like 80%. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying the episode so far, please consider hitting the like button. It really helps us out when it comes to growth and it will tell YouTube that we should make more content like this. And so what sort of made you actually kind of go into it? How did you f find a USP and analyze competition, find, find a gap in the market? Yeah, so I, I called up this agent and said to him, could I come and spend a day with him? Um, and he very sweetly drove me around some sites and I spent eight months researching it. And because of my renewables background, I'd asked him for some advice on planning because we developed some solar farms from a farmer's field and I kind of understood that value. If you can get planning permission, you can create a lot of value. So I looked at it and in the UK, it's, it's such an interesting market. I'm the biggest fan of the UK caravan market. It's absolutely huge. So one in 25% of all people in the UK have spent a night in a caravan in the last 12 months. There are 1.2 million caravans. By that, I mean not just static caravans, lodges, which are twin unit caravans, but also touring caravans, motorhomes. So it's a huge industry. Mm. And it's you know quite similar to the US in that the market is extremely fragmented. A lot of owners of parks typically own one site and yeah. that's it. Yeah. You have some very big corporate operators um, who own, you know, at the higher end. And these businesses are great businesses. They do a terrific job for the customers who want lots of facilities and shops and arcades and pools. That's not us. Okay. So we very deliberately um, focus at the lower end in terms of f availability of facilities. And we're in some of the best tourist destinations in the UK. And mm. the plan is on the holiday side is to continue buying great sites and strong locations, invest in them and improve the offering. Right. And long term on the residential side, we'll look to develop that up. Did you encounter um, any backlash? Because obviously... Like you said, there is a stigma around caravans and, and trailer parks and that sort of thing. So coming from a sort of quote unquote fancier background, you know, something flash like investment banking, did you encounter any kind of backlash or judgment from people you knew that you were going into something that was, that is stigmatized? Um, you know, I think like everything, it is and it isn't stigmatized. I mean, as I was saying earlier, the industry is huge. It provides a great opportunity for people. In many ways, it's a huge UK success story because all the caravans are built in the UK. Mm. Um, it's been around for a very, very long time. Obviously, everyone, kind of Billy Butlin was the origins of that business. And Butlins and Pontins and, you know, have that fantastic history. And then in the UK, the biggest or the most profitable is Haven which is a brand which has been going for 50 years and, and super successful, which Blackstone bought two or three years ago. From my friends, no. Um, you know, they just thought it was such an interesting thing. And, you know, I, look, I'm, I'm not... I haven't necessarily had the most uh, kind of uh, clear-cut path. You know, I haven't been a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. So, you know, the fact that I did renewables before, they just thought it, it was another interesting idea. I'm curious to know kind of how someone is able to get started in this industry because I would have thought there's a huge amount of upfront capital that's required. Yeah. And when you're competing with the likes of kind of, you know, P portfolio companies like yeah. the Blackstones um, portfolio, kind of how, how does an individual come into that market? Yeah, no, James, it, look, it is a good question. I, I didn't have the financial resources myself and so I went to to kind of six or seven private individuals who are wealthy, successful people and said, look, I have this idea, will you back me? Mm -hmm. I got the original investment from them. I think though, you c it depends of the scale that you want to start. You know, you can set up or buy a small campsite and develop it over time using, you know, not huge amounts of money. So it is quite open in that sense. It's like everything, if you want to do it well and you want to be successful, it's super competitive and you, you've got to ultimately, the key thing is just focus on your customer, focus on your customer and then focus on your team. And then if you do those two things, the money will follow. How much would you say someone would need access to in order to, to get into this industry? You know, if you, if you have access to land, i.e. you come from a family, like a farming family, you, you know, you don't need that much. All you need to do is apply. Anyone who owns a piece a field can apply for a 28-day license, or maybe it's 56 days now, and you can have tents in that field. Okay. Oh. So, you know, it's not... You literally... That's... It probably costs £100. Okay. So... That's really good to know. Yeah. 
it's super accessible and yeah. and yeah I wouldn't have known that now of course as you evolve your campsite if you want to put in shower blocks toilet blocks if you want to provide electricity then you will have to invest but it's not some sites are you know very low key interesting what would you say then are some of the the kind of the gaps in the market that you think could still be accessible by someone that's, that's looking to go into the sector where do you see a gap um so look i i, I of course never predicted the horrors which were covid but i did see in the US this whole movement towards people being outdoors, mental health, wanting to be closer to nature, away from electronics, away from screens. Um, and I think that is a trend which isn't going away quite rightly. It should be encouraged. We definitely want to be, you know, part of that. Um, so, you know, we kind of, one of the words we have is holidays by nature. And we think that's super important. So if I was rec making a recommendation, I'd focus it focus on that end because for anyone starting out trying to compete with these massive corporate super successful very deep pocketed ba investors behind them it, that is hard mm. you're never going to have a better swimming complex yeah. shopping arcade yeah. blah, blah 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 so right. finding a niche closer to nature yeah. So if we yeah. go back then to the beginning, so you were with um, the uh, agent, you were saying, was it Cornwall? Was yeah, it? so it was down in Devon. Down yeah. in Devon, you were yeah. saying. Um, yeah, what was the sort of the process from, from when you spent so, the day with him? So I spent the day, then I asked who, who's really good in planning. He very kindly introduced me to someone who I've worked with ever since then. And then I kind of spent eight months researching the market, going to all the shows, meeting the manufacturers, meeting the agents who kind of have sites. Then I put a business plan together um, and in simple terms, what I look to do is, as I said earlier, find sites in really great locations which have uh, a touring and a camping element to them, invest in those parts and over time potentially change the planning to be able to put caravans on the site right. or, and lodges. And if I do, then typically I can improve the prof profitability of that site. Okay. So it's essentially optimizing and then adding value once you've already got the formula down. Yeah. 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 They are sense. they are great business, you know, great businesses on their own. Um, so even if we can't get the planning, there's still a great opportunity to do it. And obviously glamping has become super popular. Do you have any thoughts on the commercial property side of things? Because I think that's quite an interesting discussion at the moment. I even had it with someone the other day where on the one hand they were rallying they were a bit older and they were rallying more about the idea of, you know, it's good to get people back in the office. It's insane that everyone's at home. And I was more from the argument of people have so much more freedom when they're at home. Do you have any thoughts on that? My view on this is for s lots of people and lots of companies that can work well, getting that balance right is really hard. I think it's easier for more established businesses. The downside is in order to try and build a culture, it makes it, in my view, more difficult. Sure. Um, but like everything, I think, you know, having a blend so that people do have a bit of time to be able to work from home. But personally, I wouldn't like all of my team to be, be doing that all the time. How many is your team now? We're up to about 200. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Is that for that's full time staff? Full time staff. Okay. Yeah. That includes people on the parks yeah, as well. Sure. So, right. How do you maintain a, or even cultivate a culture within that business that, that makes people want to stay? It's, it's probably the hardest thing. Uh, and the thing that people don't spend enough time thinking about early on, um, did I necessarily, did I do it perfectly? Not at all. I make tons of mistakes. As the whole some, business, some examples. Yeah. Yeah. Whole, yeah. Uh, yeah. Where, where do I start? This <laughs> podcast would be extremely long. Um, I, look, I think what w I benefited was early on being introduced to this whole idea of B Corps. And that was really helpful to me because I learned so much about things I'd never would have thought about. So that was really good. I Does Lovett qualify as a B Corp? We're certified, yeah. That's yeah, awesome, okay. We, we got it in 2020. Right. Yeah, we got it that in 2020. It's one of the things I'm really proud of. It mm. means a lot to me, the team, hopefully our customers. I, th I, mean, I think as a consumer, when I see B Corp on something, it does give me a bit more of an incentive to purchase. And I'm not the most climate aware person i try and do my bit but it does make a difference when i see that stamp yeah look because i know how hard it is to get it. it took us a year and a half um 
and it is a lot of work to do but I'd highly recommend it for anyone anyone who wants advice is thinking about it more than happy to spend some time with you on that we have one person dedicated to just B Corp who's the B Corp champion Um, can you talk a little bit about what that process involves I know it's obviously pretty dense but just a kind of overview of what that process looks like yeah yeah sure so the good thing about B Corp is there's this kind of initial assessment online which you can do and it's deliberately hard to make sure that people are doing it for the right reasons as opposed to just greenwashing Mm. and what's what's, what's greenwashing greenwashing is when people are pretending that they really care about the environment and you know the communities but actually they're not uh very easy to do again we're not perfect you know we're in an industry which historically hasn't been that environmentally friendly because of the fact that the caravans are built from plastic Mm. um but in answer to your question, the good thing in terms of the process, you do this assessment and then they give you guidance of, it's not just about the environment, it's the way you treat your um, stakeholders, be that Uh. your customers, your suppliers, your shareholders. So there are loads of different areas. It's how you think about minimum wage, how you think about the the differences between the top pay and the lowest pay. There are literally 180 different questions in the whole thing, which you have to pr- produce evidence of. Right. And, it, and it's hard, you have to get a score of 80. We just made it three three years ago. We've just had to recertify, um, which has taken uh, my colleague. I'd love to claim that I that I did it all. It's not li- uh, a lovely colleague of mine called Leanne, who's our B Corp champion and help of an external consultant. But it's really, really good. And it just means I, I 100% believe in what they stand for, which is putting purpose before profit, I think you can ha- have a successful financial business and do good as well. And I don't want to come across as like sermonizing I because that's not that's not me and no system is ever perfect. Yeah. So I totally take on board criticisms of it, but it's a start. And as a process and as a community, we are open to, you know, if anyone's got better ideas, we're all ears. But it's a group of companies who really want to do better and strive to do better. And there's been amazing stories, success stories. Mm. You mentioned that caravans have historically been built out of plastic. Yeah. That kind of made my ears spring up a little yeah. bit. Is there something, do you foresee a solution where that is not the case that you are able to somehow maneuver? I, I think, um, yes, there will always be a level probably right. until some cleverer scientists and I find that alternative but it's how you kind of reduce that impact. So to give you an example for us is we started to introduce renewable technologies on our sites. We just did a solar scheme on one of our sites in Cornwall. We're seeing how that that goes. We had one in Kent as well. Then we're shifting all the vehicles over time from petrol and diesel to electric. Um, So there's loads of things. Mm. What's what's your split of interest between holiday parks and permanent residences? If, yeah, if so we own at this moment in time eight parks, okay. and of all the kind of little areas in our industry, we call them pitches. Yeah, ninety eight percent are holiday, okay. and a very small, tiny minority is residential. Okay, and can you talk through the pricing then of um, of some of these of some of these homes, both from a holiday perspective, but also from a sort of permanent resident perspective? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. It, like everything, it depends on the size of those homes, the location of those homes, whether they're secondhand or we call them pre-loved or new. And um, the way we make our money as a business in two main ways, we sell holidays. So people come on holiday with us and they choose different accommodation types. So we have camping pitches where people pitch up in their tents, stay for a couple of nights and leave. We have touring pitches where people in their cars pull their caravan behind okay. or they turn up in their motorhomes. We have glamping, so we have luxury shepherd's huts, safari tents. Oh, wow. Yeah. We have static caravans, then we have twin unit static caravans, lodges, and then on the residential side, they're known as park homes where people live all the year round. Yeah, it's their sure. primary residence. Which would be the equivalent to a trailer park. Yeah, exactly. Right, well, in the US, trailer parks can be known as RV parks, i.e. holiday, or the residential known as manufactured housing communities, that right. kind of prefabricated piece. Okay. Got you. In answer to your question, James, the pricing really varies, as I said earlier, but also in t- on timing. So the most expensive time to come on holiday with us is in the six week period of the school holidays, so July and sense. August, yeah. and then kind of Easter, you know, those bank holidays. 
But outside of that, one of the reasons why I love the industry is it is super, super accessible. See, you can rent a caravan on one of our parks this month for six people for maybe £30 a night wow. per person. Okay. So it's a great industry, yeah. done well. There's some fantastic operators out there. There's some fantastic people who own their own sites. And we're always learning from them, always copying their ideas, or yeah. hopefully some of them are copying our ideas. And it's it's great. It's a really good, fantastic industry. As I said, I'm its biggest fan. From the, from the suite of different products or services that you offer, is there one that's most profitable? And if so, have you been tempted to kind of double down on that particular offer? Um, you know, we like a mix. We always take the view, any person, whether they're buying a luxury lodge from us, which can be a lot of money, or renting a tent pitch, once they step foot outside of their accommodation, everyone's equal. So we like the mix. We don't want our parks to be kind of five-star, exclusive, membership only. Right. You know, that's not us. We are caravan park operators, which by its definition is accessible. And we're proud of that fact. That's awesome. What have been some of the kind of more challenging moments of the business, both from a scaling perspective, but maybe also from a day-to-day -day running perspective? You know, I, look, as I said earlier, running businesses are really hard. No one should ever go into it. It has huge benefits. <laughs> Just it cut is. it off there. No one should ever go into yeah. it. Just yeah, yeah. it has huge benefits, but it also has downsides versus a kind of nine to five job, a salary job. Um, You're smiling to yourself as you say that. I'm smiling to myself because sometimes I wake up in the morning, you know, everyone has bad days. I have yeah. bad days, I have bad weeks, bad months, bad years even. Yeah. Um, you know, you just have to try and remain level through it because otherwise you go mad. And that's not easy. You know, I've said before on a podcast, it is it is, it is, difficult. I'm also, so no one, you know, there's no violin playing in the background. I have the best job in the world. I'm extremely lucky. Um, the, the challenge is, so, you know, they're many fold. I, I guess as, this, as an entrepreneur and a founder, your job is to set the strategy. It's to hire good people and it's to make sure it doesn't go bust. Those are the three things that I think about all the time. In terms of not going bust, the most important thing is cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. You can have great ideas, you can have great teams, you can have great periods, but if you either get too greedy too cocky you will go bust and that is that I've learned that over time so when we were doing the renewables I hadn't read that concept yeah. which seems so obvious okay. I didn't pay enough attention to it and fortunately the principal the guy I was working for did bail us out whereas if he if we hadn't had that person there we would have gone bust the second thing is in terms of strategy you know things evolve uh you know, obviously we had to deal with COVID. So in 2020, um, March, Monday, March 23rd, Boris announced that we were locking down. Suddenly we didn't have a business because we weren't selling any holidays. Yeah. We weren't selling any yeah. caravans. You're probably one of the most affected industries of, of all of COVID. So we were because we were classified as hospitality, but we had it nowhere near as bad as say nightclubs, bars, yeah. pubs, you know, I'm still to this day what nightclubs have had to put up with. The whole nighttime industry is horrendous. And I'm so sorry for the people who've worked in that space. And I just hope that people are supporting them. And Out of music. interest, why was it why was it not as bad for your industry? Because logic would dictate that you can't go on a holiday either just as much as you can't go to a club. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'll tell you. And the reason why I know this was my 40th birthday it was June the 23rd, 2020. <laughs> that day, Boris announced that holiday parks were opening up. We make the okay, majority of right. our money in July and August. So we missed wow. one or maybe it was a week, 10 days okay. of July, but we were able to open. And obviously interest exploded. Because oh. people could be out of their house. Yeah. So people could be out of their house. Suddenly they couldn't go abroad. Mm. Conditions will yeah. never, ever be better. Yeah, they were that funneled. Period. They were literally yeah. <laughs> funneled no, 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 no. park. They weren't allowed out and then they were. And the only place they're allowed to go yeah, is your yeah. park. That's great. So... You know, James, that was a super hard time because each site, we suddenly, on June the 24th, woke up to 700 answer phone messages, 1,000 yeah. here, 2,000 here. Wow. And it was very overwhelming for my teams. And I'm just so grateful, like everything, every love at success is their success. The fact that they dealt with it 
we got through it. Yeah. There there were hard times. Um, so coming back to, I, I said, obviously, finances, strategy, and people. You know, people always say as entrepreneurs, the hardest thing in any business is finding good people, and that remains the case. Um, you know, it's something I really struggle with because obviously I love my business probably more than anyone at Lover ever will do just because, you know, it's like a child. Mm. I've helped create it along with the help of my team. But I, you know, I can't understand why anyone wouldn't want to just be on it 24-7, but that's unrealistic yeah. and one of my many faults. So, you know, look, the industry, as I said, is a great industry. There's lots of opportunities. Um, there's lots of moving parts to our business because when you think about it, we have sites where it's not just offering accommodation, it's activities, it's sometimes food on site. So there are loads of opportunities for us to screw up, mm. offer a bad service, um, for people not to turn up, be sick, cleaning not to be done, food not to be done, reception not to be done. And it's you know really thanks to my team. And as we've grown, hopefully we put in more processes to stop that happening. There are always issues and it's just how you deal with them. Every time you've sort of spoken about the company so far, you have a really big smile on your face. You mm. clearly love it. Um, so I think I know my answer, but I'm going to ask anyway. If tomorrow, knowing everything you know about this industry now, you had the option to start this business again, would you go into this industry again? 100%. Why? Well, look, there are loads of reasons. One is we're not done. And by that, I mean, there are still such beautiful locations in the UK, which we'd love to find sites where we think we could improve them and offer a great service to customers. So, you know, for me, it's a lovely part of my job being able to go to some of the best locations in the UK. And, you know, when you think about the UK, people kind of sometimes will talk it down or say the standards are not as high as in France or, or Europe but actually it's come on so much and you know there's nowhere better than being you know in some of our counties in the summer like I would not want to be abroad at all like when you think of the headache of getting on an aeroplane the cost the cost of car hire and so there's that element the second is the fact that you know we we 100% believe in sustainability of tourism right? and think that, you know, as I was saying earlier, that trend of people being more outdoors, appreciating nature is going to continue growing. And we, we want to be part of that. The third is the fact that they are good businesses. You know, if you get the focus on the customers, focus on your team, you will make money. And it's quite a simple business in some respects. The downside is operationally, you know, there are lots of moving parts. Right. But what we are trying to do, because we're just selling holidays, selling holiday homes, you know, it's, I think people, it makes it easier for people to understand what we're about as, as a business. So off the back of that, if there was one thing that would put you off joining this industry again from it, scratch, well, what would it be? Just the, the all the operational elements to it. Right. And the fact that, there are so many opportunities to trip up for us as a business to screw up. And so you have to be on it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a seven day a week. The weekends are some of our busiest periods. So that is sometimes hard to manage just because you're never off. Yeah. Do you find um, it gets... Sorry if you're going to say something there. No, no. I, but again, I don't want to come across like I am nowhere near trying to compare us or say that we work harder than say doctors or nurses or you know people on the front line so I don't think I, anyone would get that from what you said no no but you know as I said I feel very very lucky to be in the space I think it's only going to get better as standards improve like the perception of our industry sometimes to your point earlier Ollie, it can be one that is from the 1960s you know, and what's interesting to me, sometimes when I meet with financiers, I say, Have it, has everyone been on a caravan park holiday? No. Tell me why. And it's interesting kind of, yeah. you know, it's partly maybe a criticism of the industry that they could have done a better job of promoting it. Because as I said, caravan holidays can be great, great options for people. And let, let me give you some stats. There are 100 million domestic holidays every year. 26% of those are self-catering, flats, and cottages. But 
if I take, you know, any families with young kids, you're always thinking, what am I going to do next? I've got to do this activity, mm -hmm. that activity, that activity. Actually, not only is that quite expensive, but it's also a headache because you're always having to drive, go somewhere. Whereas on parks, you have everything there because we'll have a little playground, you'll have a little shop, you might have a little kind of um, area where you can eat food. And then on our sites, we have nature trails. You know, there's lots of things where we promote. Okay being outdoors. That's actually a really good point. When you take a kid on holiday, you have to find stuff for them to do. I see it with my sister. 24-7. Yeah. Also, yeah. guys, if you think, if you rent, even if you don't have kids, if you are staying in a hotel, you're confined to your hotel room or the pool. It, it's not like you necessarily will hang out in the reception lobby or yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. you know, sit yeah. on the sofa. Whereas self-catering is really great because it's like having your home and you might decide to go out for a meal, but then you might decide, actually, no, I want to stay indoors and do mm -hmm. cook my own. And the standards are unbelievable. Like the Times did a, a story about operators in our space trying to lift standards. And I said that the quality now of caravans and lodges is much better than people's homes. Much better. Interesting. Like Really? Yeah, floor to ceiling length windows, all the more cons, super energy efficient. Yeah. Um, See, why don't I know that? That's like, I would never have, I mean, floor to ceiling windows, yeah, for example. Yeah. I mean, it's why would, but that, to, to your point about perception, I guess, why do you think I don't know that? Because it's not a fashionable industry. Right. That's the reason. So. Do you think you can make it fashionable? I don't know whether I want to make it fashionable. What I. That's an interesting answer. What I want to do is just make sure that our standards are very high, that we offer great value for money. And for the large part, even when we do screw up, we accept our mistakes and go, yeah, we should have done better and we are going to do better. So what's the end goal then for, for lovers? There isn't, there isn't really one. I mean, I, again, you know, I got into this because I, I just think housing in the UK can be done better. That is a big thing for me. Um, we, the Times like mentioned it last year that we started a project with Thomas Heatherwick, the architect, because both him and I believe that in the same thing um, and so ultimately we will end up hopefully working with Heatherwick Studio to design housing that is beautifully designed and affordable and if we can do developments in the countryside and, and you know lessen the impact if not enhance the landscape well I'll be really happy from an investment perspective what makes a good holiday park if I look at the industry from a financial perspective, there are characteristics of the industry which are very good or appealing. That is, one is there's a rent on in people who buy holiday homes with us pay what's known as a pitch fee, which is in return for us maintaining the park, looking after their holiday homes, they pay us an annual fee. So that is attractive. Um, the second is the fact that when we sell holiday homes, we make a margin, and that varies according to the type of accommodation or holiday home they just bought so that is attractive the third is the fact that you you do have cash flow from people coming on holiday with us and then the fourth is the fact that hopefully over time if you're lucky and you work hard and engage with the local authorities you can change the planning permission to, so that that will enable you to move the park into high yielding uh, accommodation types so you know, in a sense, the revenues are quite predictable, the margins can be good, and ultimately, long term, the trends are in your favor because not all operators offer a great customer service. And so if you can show that you do and you care and the standards and you've invested in your parks, hopefully your business should grow. Stamp of quality, really. Like like most things. Yeah, exactly. Like most things. I mean, it all comes down to we are obsessive about reviews. Okay. Obsessive. Like I, we watch Google, Facebook, TripAdvisor, and if we get a bad review, you're on that it. Is, we are on it. And again, as I said, you know, sometimes we screw up, and uh, we have to admit that we were wrong. So that's a really humble way to look at it. No, it's just that is reality. Like, I know, I, but I think I think. It's just interesting to hear someone actually say that out loud who runs a business. You know, I think being able to say sorry is some people really struggle with that. I've always been quite lucky in that respect because I'm still so delighted that someone's actually 
found us, spent some money, and come on holiday with us. So I'm always so grateful to them. That that's done that. I think that's clearly quite important to remember how it felt, whether it's an agency and it's your first client, or whether it's a product and it's your first sale. Remembering that moment that there was a time where you didn't think anyone was going to buy anything, and remembering yeah, no, no. that I, it being blows like, my mind. Yeah, when I walk around the parks and there are people there having a good time, enjoying it. Or seeing my teams, you know, people progressing in their careers under us or learning and thinking that, you know, this crazy idea that I had inspired by, you know, some friends has come, come to reality. Mm. So that's, again, one of the many reasons why I love the job. Um, you mentioned, obviously, wife and kids. Yeah. I'm always interested in the fact that some entrepreneurs feel like they have to have a kind of total disparity. They're like, I can't think about that until my business is up and running. And then obviously some have the benefit of having that support system in place. Um, I'm curious to know, have there been any things that have stood out or things that you would point out um, when it comes to juggling a marriage and also children with starting a business, which is obviously quite time intensive and stressful time and can put a lot of stress on relationships and sometimes and probably fairly frequently even break them. Yeah. Look, as I said earlier, it's really hard find the right partner. I'm very, very lucky that my lovely wife, you know, has borne the brunt of that. And um, can I ask how long you've been married for? 13 years. Wow. So 13 years. And, you know, I think for any entrepreneur, don't screw that up or make sure because at the end of the day, what is life if you don't have friends and family? Ultimately. That's very true. Mm. And I, I, I really mean that. And I I haven't always got it right. And I regret those periods. And, you know, the cliche is, I'm sure any entrepreneur who does will regret that and look back and go, I wish I'd spent more time with my kids as I do. And I, th- and I, I spoke about this before. It is really hard to not have that guilt or not have when you've had a bad day. But that's the same in, any, in mm. every job. So... It's a com- continual struggle of mine. Mm. I, and, you know, I don't always get it right. Well, on that, do you have any advice for the struggle between wanting to scale and therefore wanting to spend a lot of time working on the business, but then also acknowledging that there have been times where you should have spent more time with your kids and wanting to do more of that as well? I think each person is different. Each person will handle things in a different way, probably much better than I will. I cannot not think about my business 24 7 i involve obviously my family as much as i can and spend as much time as i can with them but they are also very um understanding and hopefully you know it will be okay hopefully it'll be okay Mm. that's really positive it is really positive i love the way you talk about it you've always just got a big smile yeah man it's really no because i you know, I'm never going to sit here and say everything I've done has been the right thing or has been plain sailing. It's it's really hard and it's lonely. And I've spoken about this before. It is really lonely. Mm-hmm. You know, I think even if you do it with a co-founder, when you have when you do it on your own, I have an amazing team. They're fantastic. But as I always say, if anything goes wrong, it's my fault. Mm-hmm. It's my responsibility. And I can't, you know, and it's important that founders accept that um, because otherwise, you know, you can't make it better. I don't think people appreciate that enough. I've mm-hmm. I've only really learned that recently with Ollie and we've talked about it ourselves of I have a newfound respect for anybody that has gone out on their own and built mm. a business on their own because it's really bloody it's hard. So hard you know, and we, it's we're relentless. learning it. It yeah, is we're learning it. absolutely relentless. And just when you think you get a tiny hint of success yeah. or gold yeah yeah then the next day it's just life smacks you straight back <laughs> exactly <laughs> don't you dare get comfortable no no I, so I, I i i agree um but it also has so many rewards it does so you know like everything that the, there's a balance to it mm. that's very true um we like to we like to round off with the same question basically with with every guest which mm-hmm. is if you could give one piece of practical advice to someone who's looking to start a business focused on the tangible and the actionable yeah. less kind of motivational um what would what would that be for you uh someone actually asked me this uh, at the weekend and so i know what the answer is Glad to know I, 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 I stick to the answer <laughs> which is find someone really good in hr okay and i'll tell you the reason why that's the case very early on 
you will, as a founder, you will find yourself spending so much time on the HR aspect of your business to the detriment of everything else. So find a consultant to man it, help you manage that, as opposed to if you don't have the resources to bring it in house initially, because they will then deal with, you know, issues with your team, the legislation around HR, and that is. HR is so important, so important to get it right. It's important that your team, um, you show that you value it and you value their opinions and they will guide you and show you what to do. So that is the biggest piece of advice I can give. That's interesting. Awesome. I haven't anyone said that before. I think Charlie mentioned HR, HR he recruitment. He did actually, HR recruitment, two, you're right, yeah. he did. Um, yeah, you're right. Charlie Mullins, founder of Pimlico Plumbers, he was like, HR and recruitment, those are the most two. Who's, yeah, com- who's coming in and who's going out? Uh, so that's a really interesting point. Um, dude, this has been a great conversation, man. Thank you so much. Uh, it's crazy because uh, we were talking about this on the way here. You were the first external guest that we ever booked. We had about two people that we knew that we managed to get on, but you were the first guest that confirmed back when we had no studio, no subscribers, no footage, no nothing. And we finally managed to get you in the room. <laughs> I know, I am After so like a lifetime No, no, it's fine. But it's it crazy. It's just crazy how it's been like nine months and you were the first person. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's more, I'm saying that more because it's sweet that you agreed and took a chance on us to, you said you'd do it even when we had like literally nothing. Nothing, yeah. So we had, we had stock oh, guys, images. But I, I think, you know, we, and I'm gonna sound like an old fart, we have a duty because to spend time with younger people because we were all there once. What a wonderful note to end on. Um, Dude, where can people find you, man? Straight in that lens over there. Uh, Just go on our website, loveitparks.com. And if anyone wants to come on a holiday or buy a holiday home, check us out. Hell yeah. Well, Raul, thank you so much for coming on, man. Thanks, really, guys. really thank appreciate you. the conversation. Cheers, it's and, good uh, to me. Yeah, Cheers, love your story, man. Guys, hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe, turn on post notifications. And if you are listening, then please do leave a five-star review and, uh, and rate us on whether it's Spotify, Apple, or wherever you are listening. But for now, an amazing episode. We will see you in the next one.